Funding for Shape Realist is provided by Skillshare, the sponsor of today's video. Uh, I don't want to review Shrek the Musical today. It's so bad. Oh. Let's review Good Musical instead. Tell you what, I'll review the musical that aligns the closest to what Mario screams when he gets hit in Mario Kart Wii. Let's listen. <laughs> Doesn't it sound like he says Spongebob? Discuss. Anyway, I just do what the Mario says. Spongebob the musical, it is. This show took theater kids everywhere by storm and even got pretty good reviews from the stuffy Broadway elite. And as someone who falls somewhere in between excitable theater kid and stuffy Broadway elite, yeah, I like this show. It captures the energy of the original series so expertly and translates it into live action form way better than I expected it to. I think now is a great time to talk about what makes it so enjoyable, since in five years everyone's gonna be sick of it when it gets performed by every damn high school in the country. So let's get it started. Here's why the SpongeBob musical is really good and stuff. SpongeBob is fairly unique as far as musicals go. Most of the time, the songs are written by one person or a small group of people in a musical. As a result, these composers get to make their unified vision for the show's music a reality, whether that be giving certain characters recurring leitmotifs over the course of the show, developing reprises for certain songs, and so on and so forth. If you want your show's music to feel unified and cohesive, it only makes sense to get one person or team to do every song in the show. Not every show is like this. For instance, if you want your show to consist of popular music that barely fits the context of each scene, you can make a jukebox musical. Whatever happened to our love? I don't like jukebox musicals, but you do you. But like, these are really the only two sorts of musicals we see. Original songs, all written by one person or a small group of people, or pre-existing songs that you plug into your show. SpongeBob defies both of these ideas and goes for the ballsiest possible option. It's all original music, save for a few songs lifted from the cartoon. However, every one of these original songs is written by a different composer. If a regular musical is a YouTube poop, SpongeBob is a YouTube poop collab. They got so many artists to contribute their own unique musical styles to one song each. Then they strung it all together into one show. That? Sounds like a disaster. Not only do you have a show with no consistent leitmotifs or musical ideas tied to each character, but you also have such distinct and dissonant artists like T.I., Panic at the Disco, Yolanda Adams, Steven Tyler and Joe Perry, Sarah Bareilles, and more. How are you gonna make all these different artists come together and form a cohesive musical out of it? I don't know, man, but they did it. A lot of the credit goes to Tom Kitt, who co-wrote one of the best musicals of all time, Next to Normal. So, he's good. He wrote the additional music, arrangements, and orchestrations for the show, and it's in no small part due to his efforts that the show flows as well as it does musically. On top of that, the songs that were written for the show are just flat out bangers. The variation in the contributing artists means that each new song feels entirely fresh from the last. There's so many great genres and musical styles covered. The opening number Bikini Bottom Day is as Broadway opening number ask as they come. It just puts you in this great mood going into the show and meeting all the characters. It was written by Jonathan Colton, you know, the guy who wrote Still Alive and Want You Gone. He's good at making music. BFF by The Plain White Tees is just such a happy, joyous number. When the Going Gets Tough by T.I. is a fantastic rap number for Plankton, though I don't really like the version from the pro shot. It sounds better on the soundtrack, but I digress. Super Sea Star Savior by Yolanda Adams might be my favorite in the whole show. Just this amazing gospel song where Patrick gets worshipped by a random cult. I Guess I Miss You by John Legend gives off all the feels and oh my god I'm not a loser the big Squidward showstopper we've waited our entire lives for they might be giants knock this one out of the park there's only really three songs in the show I either don't care for or don't think fit the tone very well. No Control by David Bowie is catchy, but a weird addition tonally, especially as the second song. It makes sense within the plot, but it just doesn't fit as is in the show. Chop to the Top by Lady Antebellum is okay, but mostly just unnecessary filler. And then there's Poor Pirates by Sarah Bareilles. Good idea for a song, but I just don't care for it. It's not particularly good music-wise and feels like a waste of time. Wow, James, it seems like you don't like this or our Lady of the Underground, do you like 
any of the act two openers yes i do idiot letters from natasha pierre and the great comet of 1812 the best act two opener ever look it up but yeah i like the vast majority of songs in this show they generally range from good to amazing plus it's amazing that they work this well together at all the show is mostly so cohesive and while it's easy to tell that different artists wrote the songs they nonetheless fit within the story and mostly don't feel out of place and they're bops can't forget i kind of wish spongebob won the tony award for best score only because because they'd have to give out like 20 different awards for this one category and every recipient would get a tony just for writing one song it would have been funny but there's one last song we have to talk about best day ever and when talking about this song we have to address the sea rhinoceros in the room yes this project was being produced during the 2010s and it first released in 2016 long after the golden age of spongebob that ended with the first movie yes best day ever was not a good episode of spongebob even by post movie spongebob standards hell the song isn't even anything that special but by god they make it work in this musical it actually made me cry a little bit you guys it's just this tremendous burst of positivity in a dark story moment and the way it builds from a Spongebob solo, to including a couple more people, to the entire ensemble, it's actually fantastic. I think it's worth putting Spongebob elitism aside and realizing that this was the best possible song from the show to adapt into the musical. Obviously, the show had a ton of bangers, but nothing that quite worked for the context of the musical story. Well, kinda. I still think that instead of the song John Legend wrote, Spongebob and Patrick could've gotten away with singing a modified version of This Kitchen's Not the Same Without You. I'm only half joking. Truth be told, I admire how this musical doesn't lean too heavily on nostalgia and only resorts to the show's music with this song, which was a perfect choice. Oh, and they sing the theme song during the curtain call, which like, how could they not? It's a perfect little bonus. Wow, I had more to say about the songs than I expected. How about those sets, though? The miraculous thing about the Spongebob musical is that we can actually watch it! Nickelodeon aired a special presentation of it in 2019, a year after it closed. Hey Broadway! Normalize releasing pro shots of musicals, especially after their run on Broadway is finished and you literally only have money to gain from doing so! Anyway, we can see Spongebob in all its HD, non-slime tutorial glory. And it looks TREMENDOUS, you wanna see? From a cluster of kelp made out of pool noodles, to some coral resting on some old blue oil can, to a treacherous mountain made out of cardboard boxes, the whole show has this DIY theater aesthetic that feels incredibly creative and never comes across as cheap. It echoes how Bikini Bottom in the show is made out of random objects like pineapples and buckets and lobster traps. The sets here are just filled with so much imagination. There's a lot of cool diorama work in certain scenes, some classic title cards and backgrounds, stretchy arms, this amazing versatile sofa during the BFF song. Oh my god, it's so good. This show goes all out on the scenic design, which it won a Tony for. Should have gotten costumes too, because they're wildly creative and they feel like a natural extension of the set. From Squidward's extra legs that he miraculously manages to tap dance in, to Mr. Krabs' big meaty claws, to Plankton doing his best Goro Majima cosplay, to everyone else in the ensemble. They seriously did not need to go this hard on the visual presentation of the show, but they did it anyway. So all the props to David Zinn for designing all this. And of course, to the director Tina Landau, not only for her work in developing the look of the show, but also the feel. This musical feels like a live action cartoon, as it should. Everyone moves and interacts in an exaggerated way, and they never stop to question the kookiness around them. The fourth wall is nice and loose. So many moments of motion are punctuated with sound effects, including the iconic walkie noises of Spongebob, Squidward, and Mr. Crap. All these touches are absolutely endearing and make for such a colorful, visually and audibly stimulating experience. Tragically, I never saw this show live, but I have friends who have and they told me just how cool and immersive it was thanks in no small part to the excellent sets and costumes. I mean, they made a flat version of Old Man Jenkins for when he gets crushed by a boulder. Now that's a spicy good set piece. But all this set decoration is enhanced even more by the characters and the story and other nautical nonsense. Sense.
One of my favorite aspects of this musical is the way the characters are interpreted. The actors were specifically instructed not to do impressions of the characters as they are in the show, but rather to make them their own. And I think this technique really paid off, particularly with Ethan Slater as Spongebob. God, what a perfect embodiment of the character. He feels young, overwhelmingly bubbly and positive, and a little bit naive. Honestly, it's such a captivating performance that 100% deserved a Tony, and I will DIE MAD THAT HE DIDN'T WIN! But, you know, the band's visit was good too, I hear, so okay, sure. But come on, though, look at this lad, he's so good. Anyway, though, the rest of the cast is excellent too, but I specifically want to highlight the roles each character plays in the story. SpongeBob's arc in the musical is admittedly very similar to that of the first movie. He wants to be manager and break away from being called a simple sponge, like how he didn't want to be called a kid. It's familiar, but it works, and it's not the primary focus. Most importantly, the main plot is different enough. Basically, in this musical, a giant volcano is gonna erupt and kill everyone unless Spongebob, Patrick, and Sandy can stop it using Sandy's invention, the Eruptor Interrupter. D d d do, you get, do you get what she did there? She, she did like a thing. The ingenious bubble device. Don't touch. The plot is high stakes and different enough from all the show specials that it works really well and it lets us spend more time with Spongebob, Patrick, and Sandy as a trio, which we don't get often enough. Most of the time it's always Spongebob and Patrick on another whirlwind adventure. The movie is one big grand journey for Spongebob and Patrick, while Sandy gets like two lines, I think. That's kind of lame. Sure, with the movie, adding Sandy to the journey doesn't really fit since it's all about Spongebob and Patrick coming to terms with the fact that they like childish things and that it's okay to do so. And this doesn't apply to Sandy. Plus, when they get to Shell City, it's not like Sandy is going to have a near-death experience because land. This is where she thrives. So whatever. Due to these circumstances, she's sadly not important to Spongebob's big first movie. The musical takes the opposite approach. It does Sandy so right in a way that the show rarely does. She's pivotal to inventing the solution that'll stop the volcano and accompanying Spongebob on the journey to save Bikini Bottom. Plus, they use her character as a way to combat bigotry and prejudice, which, yeah, makes perfect sense. Sandy is a land mammal living among sea creatures, and these simple fish folk are probably prone to lash out at an outsider in times of crisis. Is any of this subtle? The mayor said she'll handle it, and everyone knows you can always trust the government. Uh-huh. Oh god, no. It's a pretty pointed and blatant rebuttal of the US administration at the time, and it does come across as pretty heavy-handed. But I don't know, man. It's a good message regardless about how we should avoid prejudices and accept our differences. And in 10 years, it'll probably feel less preachy while still being relevant and important. The idea that Sandy is an outsider to fish society was really only explored once in pre-movie Sponge Bob in the episode Squirrel Jokes. I think that's a solid deconstruction of how edgy or racist comedy can warp people's perceptions over time, and how it's not quite as harmless as many people want to believe. That episode didn't really feel like it was pushing an agenda in the same way Sandy's plot in the musical does, but it's not a bad agenda to be pushed. I think the musical did Sandy well and made her character feel like more of a main character than the show does. Patrick is a goofy sidekick as always before he breaks up with Spongebob to go lead a random cult that worships him that kinda sprung up out of nowhere. I don't get it and they don't really go anywhere with this cult, but it's kinda fun. The song is incredible. And above all, Patrick doesn't feel like a huge selfish jerk, which is a pitfall modern Spongebob tends to fall into a lot. He just feels misguided and gets taken in by this cult appreciating his divine wisdom, so it's hard to hate him here. Mr. Krabs is another character that can go south real quick if you play up his money obsession too heavily. But I think they struck a great balance. He does sort of learn to appreciate his daughter Pearl over his money, and I enjoy their song a lot. They totally nailed Plankton from his extreme pettiness to this weird yet hilarious sexual tension between him and Karen. It's not weird that the actor isn't tiny either. You understand that the characters see him as tiny, while you kind of forget that as you watch big Plankton on stage. His size doesn't matter. The character is still in body tremendously well. Squidward standing on the sidelines the entire show, waiting for his big break, only to get one fantastic show-stopping act two number. Perfect. Absolutely amazing. I didn't need him to join Spongebob on this epic journey. I needed the most likely to love Broadway Spongebob character to get his big, incredible Broadway moment, even if it was all in his head. And bro, that moment when everyone stops singing in Best Day Ever and they all wait on Squidward to continue the number, and he actually 
actually does. Love that shit, bro. I'm so glad they put it in. And Mrs. Puff is a heavy drinker, which, yeah, I can totally see that. Overall, the characters are extremely faithful, and the story is a pretty good one. Though I think what holds the show back a bit is the way the story is paced. SpongeBob resolves to prove that he's not a simple sponge and save everyone from the volcano in the middle of Act 1. And then he just doesn't start the journey till Act 2. First, we gotta have Mr. Krabs and Pearl's number, another song about resolving to save the town with Patrick and Sandy this time, the aforementioned Patrick Star cult song, and an Act 1 closer about what's gonna happen tomorrow with this volcano threat. Bro, you could have just stopped the volcano today. I guess Sandy needed time to build her invention, but I don't know, just write that out. Get the journey going sooner since the back half of Act 1, while fun, feels like we're just waiting for the main plot to start. This structural issue is my biggest problem with the musical, and I don't think it would have been too difficult to fix it. All the songs could stay where they are, just start to trek up the volcano after Hero is my middle name, and make Plankton more of an active threat. Also, the show could have been funnier, especially considering it derives from what was formerly one of the funniest cartoons ever. A lot of the jokes feel like season 4 Spongebob. Not bad, but not incredible like the first three seasons. Also, also, I am immensely disappointed that they never made a we should take Bikini Bottom and push it somewhere else reference when discussing what to do about the volcano. With that said, however, there's a whole lot of great fan service in this show. Tasteful, not excessive, not in your face fan service. Let us discuss that now. SpongeBob's very first line in the musical is Good morning, world, and all who inhabit it. And as soon as he said that, I knew I was in for a great time. This musical sprinkles in a ton of great classic lines from the first three seasons of the show in ways that fit in naturally and don't feel overly frequent. It knows exactly what kind of fan service we want, but also knows how to be restrained when delivering it. Mr. Krabs and Plankton swear at each other using dolphin noises. You know, the same ones I use when I say stuff like fucking sh** on top knocker. There's a my leg joke at one point. Patrick asks if mayonnaise is an instrument. Plankton admires a lemon-scented plan of his, and there's a few other references here and there you can discover for yourself. Lines like these really give off the sense that the creators cared about us classic fans of Spongebob, and it's much appreciated. Now, Tom Kenny pre-recorded lines as the French narrator for the Broadway show, but in the filmed version that aired on Nickelodeon, they actually got him to appear as Patchy the Pirate. I just think that's really cool, seeing him live on stage performing. It warms my heart a little bit. I don't know, man, I got a little emotional watching this show. Not just because of the show itself, but more so because of what it represents. I mean, we all love Spongebob, and when you see a live-action adaptation get everything so right in terms of adapting the original animated series, it just makes you so happy. Because this just doesn't happen. Live-action remakes usually suck the joy and life out of everything. They turn classic, expressive Disney movies into drab, poorly filmed, sometimes horrifying exercises in boredom. They turn perfectly plotted epics like Avatar The Last Airbender into embarrassing, tonally flat nightmares. They turn a brilliant subversion of the Disney formula like Shrek into a boring, basic, wannabe Disney show that misses the entire f***ing point of the original film! Spongebob the Musical is not like that. Not only does it benefit from a brand new story that only adapts the original show's characters, thus allowing for better tailoring to a musical format, but it goes all out in establishing a gorgeous, colorful wonderland that emulates the original show while remaining its own thing. It embodies the energy of cartoons better than any live-action musical I've ever seen. Is it the deepest or the funniest musical out there? No, but it doesn't need to be. It's a more than worthy expansion to Spongebob as a franchise. I mean, it is a lot better than almost everything Spongebob related that came out after the first movie, and I'm more than thrilled about that. If you dismiss this when it came out because live-action remake of something nostalgic equals bad, give it another chance. This is a great show with a brilliant vision, and it's easily accessible for you to watch right now. Hell, even if you're not into musicals, I think this is still worth a watch. Because of how cartoony it is, it's not hard to suspend your disbelief at all and believe these characters are breaking out into song. Maybe this show will even help you get into musicals, who knows? It's a great introduction to all that the medium has to offer. Plus it has these iconic characters you know and love. Basically, everyone should watch it. And don't watch Shrek the Musical, it will suck your soul out and leave your empty husk behind to be picked at by buzzards. I know from experience. Good night, Bikini Bottom.
Actually, before I say goodnight for realsies, I just want to admire how skilled Sandy is at karate and building inventions that prevent volcanoes from erupting. Do you want to become as skilled as Sandy? Of course you do, who wouldn't? A good way to start getting there is with Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of inspiring classes for creative and curious people. With topics like illustration, music production, film and video, and much more, you could explore new skills, deepen existing passions, and get lost in creativity. This is a site that legitimately makes learning new skills fun and easy since the lessons are broken up into short chunks that you can watch at your own pace. It's so engaging as a result. With Skillshare, you can find inspiration in the moment and learn how to express your creativity. Right now, I'm really enjoying Animating with Ease in After Effects by Jake Bartlett. As someone who hosted a reanimated collab despite having no knowledge of how to animate, I kind of wanted to learn that. And this class makes learning After Effects fun and easy. It's a great course for beginner and pro animators alike on how to use this software efficiently and effectively. Skillshare is curated specifically for learning, meaning there are no ads, and they're always launching new premium classes so you can stay focused and follow wherever your creativity takes you. And it's less than $10 a month with an annual subscription. Plus, the first thousand of my subscribers to click the link in the description will get a free trial of premium membership so you can explore your creativity. Click that link in the description before all the spots are gone and enjoy this incredible supply of free knowledge. Thank you.